In this module, we're going to take a look at financial statements. This isn't intended to be an exhaustive view of financial statements as you might have in a comprehensive accounting course, but just a very brief overview of the two most basic of financial statements, an income statement and a balance sheet, which ultimately are tools for managers to use in running, managing, growing, and developing a business. We'll take a look at the uh, tools managers might think about. We'll look at the income statement itself, the balance sheet. We'll look at book values versus market values for a moment, make the distinction between those, and then we'll look at some examples with respect to a sample company, a fictitious sample company. So the financial statement as a tool for managers lets us consider five very basic elements. The balance sheet, the income statement, the changes in financial condition, cash flow statement, and statement of changes in equity. Now, those happen to be uh, five completely separate statements, and clearly they go beyond the balance sheet and income statement, but you need to know that financial managers, uh, firm managers, entrepreneurs, uh, executives use all five of these. Again, we're going to focus on just two, but they use all five of these to develop some metrics. Those metrics have to do with the assets, the liabilities, the incomes, expenses, profits or losses, taxes, shareholder equity, solvency of the company, and various performance ratios. So these are the items from these five statements that the managers most seriously consider. And we'll focus for a moment on the performance ratios because those are ones that, regardless of their nominal values, can help us compare one firm or one division within a firm's uh, performance versus another. The performance ratios that we probably are the most concerned about begin with profit margin, and profit margin, just as we've indicated, is the net income of a company divided by its revenue. So it gives us an idea of how much of our revenue is turning into profit. So we know the rest of that has become expense. We get to then see the return on assets. So managers are entrusted with a firm's assets, which might be uh, hard assets like property, plant, and equipment, might be intellectual assets such as uh, technology, innovation, patents, etc. Uh, it might be human human assets, human capital, uh, our, our workers, our decision makers, our innovators. They're entrusted with these assets and they're expected to receive a reasonable return on the value of those assets. So here we will take the net income of a company and divide it by the total value of the assets. We'll talk more about net income a little bit later, but just recognize that net income is all of the company's real cash income after all expenses have been paid, after depreciation has been considered, after we then uh, pay our interest expenses, after we pay our taxes. It is before we've distributed income to our shareholders. So net income is the money that we've got left after all of our operation, interest, and taxes. So that's our the, what we have as a return. We take it against the total assets to give us a return on assets. Similarly for a return on equity. Equity, as we'll define it a little bit, is going to be shareholder equity, or that which the shareholders, stakeholders perhaps, that which they own of the company, which you might think of it kind of loosely as net worth, if you will. And so we'll take the net income divided by the total equity, and that gives us a return on equity. It's important to note that we can't simply say a particular return on assets or a particular return on equity or a particular profit margin is good or bad. Oh, well, certainly negative values in either in any of these cases would be seen as uh, as as less advantageous, probably bad. But I don't know that I can say 4% profit margin is better than 6% profit margin unless I'm looking at a similar Companies. If I look at a company that's got 4% profit margin in grocery versus a company with 20% profit margin in consumer apparel retail, I can't say that the 20% is better because I'm looking at an apple and an orange here. You have to compare grocer to grocer consumer apparel retail to consumer apparel retail. The margins in grocery are very, very small. 
the margins in consumer apparel retail <clears throat> are very, very large, and you might expect there to be an even greater profit margin than 20% there. So when we're considering these performance uh, metrics, these performance ratios, we can't easily say one is good and one is bad unless they're expressly negative until we're comparing one against its peer group. So a auto manufacturer against an auto manufacturer, a technology company against a technology company. Maybe if we had a pharmaceutical manufacturer against a transportation firm, one having a really high profit margin, one having a really low profit margin, we have a very difficult time saying which of those is better. This must be an apples and apples comparison. So as we move on, one of the next performance criteria that we have to think about is called a quick ratio. A quick ratio gives us a sense of whether or not we've got the resources to cover our near-term uh, expenses. So in this case, it would be our current assets minus our inventory divided by current liabilities. And again, we'll define these elements in a few more minutes, but current assets is a sum of our inventory, our cash, and any accounts receivable. So those items that we either have as cash or can turn into cash in a relatively short period of time, current liabilities are the debts that we have that are due in a short period of time. Accounts payable, wages payable, taxes payable, and such. So if we take the current assets minus the inventory, that really leaves us cash and accounts receivable. And we're going to divide that by current liabilities. Well, the inference being cash we know is cash. Accounts receivable, we're going to be able to turn that into cash over the next several weeks, maybe a few months, as our customers pay those accounts receivable. An account receivable is what our customers owe us because we've given them products or services. So we know that in a relatively short order, that's going to become cash, and we can then use that to pay our current liabilities. So this is a ratio of that. It's a quick ratio. It's also referred to as an asset test. A current ratio... It's simply going to be our current assets divided by our current liabilities. Now, the difference between these two, of course, is that for the quick ratio, we subtracted out inventory. And here's part of why. We're not directly in control of when our inventory sells, and we may have to change the value on our inventory. By that, I mean we may have to discount it in a minor way, or we may have to discount it in a major way to get it to sell. Because of that, the quick ratio probably is a better measure for a, a manager to know how solvent they are in the near term. And, and again, it's called the acid test. The current ratio, though, still gives us a sense, but it has the weakness of us having the uncertainty about our inventory sales. Uh, current ratio is, always refer, is also referred to as a coverage ratio. Networking capital will be current assets minus current liabilities. Current assets are cash possibly receivables if I can turn them into cash in a relatively short period of time. Inventory, that similarly I can turn into cash in a relatively short period of time. And then accounts receivable, which will turn into cash as my customers pay me, once again within the terms of our contracts, probably 30, 60, or 90 days, and relatively short period of time. When I subtract from that what I owe in that same short period of time, my accounts payable, or those things I owe my vendors if I've bought product for them on, from them on terms, or maybe I owe my employees the end of the pay period has already passed, but I haven't paid them yet because I pay a week in arrears or two weeks in arrears, maybe taxes that I have uh, calculated but not paid yet, etc. Those are my current liabilities. So my current assets minus my current liabilities are thought of as my net working. When managers look at these, managers consider the fiscal period versus a calendar period, or fiscal year versus a calendar year. So a calendar year, of course, is January 1st through December 31st. A uh, calendar period would be January 1st through maybe the last day of January, January 31st, or April 1st versus April 30th. Those would be calendar periods, and I think we all very easily understand those. But we might have fiscal periods as well. Some companies do not use a calendar year as their company's year or the fiscal year. Some companies may go ahead and have their year run from June 1st to June 1st. Some companies will be March 1st to March 1st, etc. When we think about accounting purely, we need to use the convention of other accountants around us, which is largely driven by the federal tax code. And 
organized in what we think of as GAAP, or Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. Generally Accepted Accounting Principles uh, simply give us all the same language to speak. Now, there does become a difference uh, when we're thinking about financial statements as accountants, in which case we're using GAAP, versus when we think about uh, financial statements as financiers, which sometimes GAAP isn't as relevant to us. Finally, then, we have to consider the issues of book value versus market value. Book value is what we actually paid for the assets that sit on our balance sheet, so those things that we have and own as a company, minus any depreciation that has been accrued against them. And depreciation is the realizing of depletion of value or obsolescence of the asset over time. Depletion of value from use, wear and tear, or obsolescence because new technology is replacing it. Depreciation is not a cash expense, but we do have to consider it because the value of the asset is reduced over time. When we acquired the asset, we exchanged cash, which is an asset of course, for let's say a printing press, which is also an asset. When we did that, we didn't get to expense the cost of that printing press because we simply exchange one asset for another, so we still have the asset. These are going to be balance sheet items, as you'll see in a few minutes, versus income statement items. But every year, we get to recognize the potential depletion of value of that asset over time or its obsolescence because of technological changes or preferences, etc. And that's called depreciation. We don't have to write a check for depreciation. It's not really a cash expenditure. It's simply an accounting expenditure or an accounting entry helping us over a period of time recognize that we actually spent cash when we bought the item. That's book value. And we can think of book value as that which we paid for the item less any accumulated depreciation. Market value, of course, is simply how much we could get for an item if we sold it today or within a reasonable period of time based upon the type of asset that it is. So if I have a car and I believe it's worth $10,000, but I have it for sale at that and it's for sale for 60 days and I finally sell it at 8000 well, its market value is 8000 Or if I have a computer and I have it up for sale for $2,000, and six months later it's still sitting there at $2,000, well, its market value wasn't $2,000, it was much less. If the real market value had been $2,000, then someone would have paid. I may end up having to discount it dramatically, or maybe only a little bit, to finally get it to sell. So the market value is the agreed-upon price between two economic agents. It's not what we think it's worth, it's what somebody else will pay us for it.